ageing population. We also know no more Senator Australians. Senator yes, you will be you. in continuation. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Canavan will be absent from question time today uh, due to ministerial duties. In Senator Canavan's absence, uh, Senator Birmingham uh, will represent the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia. Senator McKenzie will represent the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, the Minister for Regional Services, Decentralisation and Local Government, and the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Thank you, Senator Cormann. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Since 2014, how many of the government's budgets have included cuts to the pension? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Well, um, thank you very much, and I thank the Senator for her question in relation to pensions. Um, this government has a very proud record of uh, looking after older Australians. In fact, uh, uh, I'd like to be pleased to, to let the senator know that you know, we actually are a government that can be trusted to look after older Australians. And I have to say that it seems a little strange to come in here and listen to those on the other side of this chamber lecturing us about what we're doing for older Australians when, when they are the ones who were seeking to tax um, older Australians. I mean, the retirees tax, you know, a $57 billion retirees tax on older Australians. But, we, uh, but, but I would also like to say that on the 20th of September, the 20th of September, which I imagine is only a few days, well, I'm not quite sure of the date today, but the 20th of September is not too far away. Pensions order. Senator Cormann on a point of order. Uh, on a point of order, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, as is well understood by all order. in this chamber, or should be, uh, interjections are disorderly, and there are a lot of interjections uh, coming from this uh, side. And I know they don't want to hear about pensioners having been targeted by Labor with their retiree tax, but uh, there should Thank be no interjections. Thank you, interjection. Senator Sandy Cormann. You correctly, you correctly, Senator Cormann, um, draw the chamber's attention to the standing orders regarding interjections. So I ask senators to respect those standing orders. I call Senator Rustin to continue. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was just um, going to mention that um, from the 20th of September 2019, um, pensions will have increased by $125 a fortnight for singles and by $188.20 per fortnight for couples combined since the coalition came into government in 2013. Uh, and also, you know, just to, so that the Senate is aware, um, the 20th of September is, is going to be a great day for our pensioners. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Keneally on a point of order. I think I, a point of order is direct relevance, Mr. President. I've been incredibly generous in uh, allowing the minister to have more than half the allocated time. She has not answered the question and gone, or gone near it. Since 2014, how many of the budgets, how many of the government's okay. budgets, have included okay. cuts to the pension? Oh. It is just an answer. On, on One, Senator two, Keneally, three, Senator four, Keneally five, please six. resume your seat. Senator Cormann, on the point of order. Uh, on the point of order, uh, the uh, senator was indeed asked about cuts to pensions, and what Senator Rustin clearly is pointing out is that there have been increases to pensions. Pensions increase twice every year, as Senator Keneally would know if she knew anything. Thank you. Now, on the. On, on, Senator, um, what particular comment? I didn't hear. Um, I didn't hear a personal reflection in Senator Cormann's observation there, Senator Wong. On the point of point I of order, I know that Senator you're Wong. trying to protect a weak minister, but really you don't order, need to get like that. Order, order. You want me to withdraw that, Senator now? Wong? Order. I'll call Senator 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 Cormann. Did you wish to? All right. Senator, on the point of order, Senator I mean, Cormann. I, 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 would, I, would, I, would, I would just, I would, I would just say uh, Labor is getting very thin-skinned, and like okay. Senator Wong should, Senator Wong should reflect on what she just said. Um, now, on the point of order, I have allowed. I'll rule on the point of order when there's silence. On the point of order, um, I have been liberal in letting people point out part of a question when there's a legitimate point of order on direct relevance. Points of order are not an opportunity to restate the question nor grab the attention of the camera by trying to restate it in a pointed fashion. The minister was asked a question about pensions. 
it would not be relevant to talk about other policies or to talk about a more general um, observation on senior Australians, but the minister was directly talking about pensions. I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question. The minister was directly relevant, and I ask those who are seeking points of order to treat the chamber with some respect because I will start interrupting them if they are not making a point on direct relevance and merely undertaking a stunt. The minister was being directly relevant by talking about pensions. I, 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 the point of order about direct relevance was not raised by you, Senator Wong, so I'm not making an observation at all. I'm making a general observation. I'm making a general observation that points of order on direct relevance at least need to make a claim about direct relevance, not merely restate the question. On the other points of order raised by Senators Wong and Cormann, I did not hear any personal reflections. As leaders, they get some extra discretion, but they should not be using points of order to have a go at one another across the table. Um, Senator Rustin to continue. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I will continue to advise the Chamber, as I said, that pensions have increased under the watch of this government. Pension rates are indexed twice yearly, every single year. Twice yearly. Uh, on the 20th of September, again, we will be increasing the budget. Uh, in fact, pension rates will increase for singles to $933.40 per fortnight for singles and $1,407 combined for doubles. Um, these rates are indexed twice a year every year and have been indexed twice a year every year since we have been in government. But that's not all we've done for older Australians. We make sure that we assist them in other ways. I mean, for instance, the energy supplement is also provided to old. <clears throat> Order, sorry, is someone at the chair. Um, Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I, uh, I do ask a supplementary question. Since 2014, how many of the government's budgets have contained an increase in the pension age to 70? Senator Rustin. No, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Senator Keneally. Um, I will take the, express uh, your exact details of your question on notice to make sure that I do provide you with the most accurate information. But what I can say, what I can say, is this is a government that supports older Australians. And to come in here and to be lecturing us when this is the is the opposition that took to the government an intention to tax older Australians by $57 billion by attacking their retirement savings, I think really is the highest of absolute hypocrisy. I will not be standing here and be lectured by the likes of those opposite, be Order. insulted by the Leader I'm... of the Opposition when I'm actually advising the Chamber that on every occasion, on every occasion that this government has brought forward a budget uh, for, for, for increases to pensions to age pensioners every single indexed time, twice a year, every year since we have been in government. So don't come in here ledger, lecturing us when Order, you're Senator about Rustin. Time for tax. the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister explain why the prime, why Prime Minister Morrison has been so determined to cut the pension and increase the pension age and force farmers, bricklayers, and nurses to work until they are 70? Senator Rustin. Order. Order. At the front of the chamber, please lead by example. You're, I hope you're not asking me to call someone to order for interjecting, Senator Keneally. Now, this. It has been put to me on many occasions that question time is a forum for non-government parties. I'd encourage them to not provoke nor interject, and we'll have more time for questions. I, 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 I would say that there is— Senator Rustin. Oh, Senator on a point of order. I, I, I object to the description of berating. I was just pointing out that it was Labor who increased okay. the age pension Senator to 67 Senator, years Senator of age. Senator Cormann, that's not a point of order. <laughs> Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I'd just like to say that we are the government that backs older Australians, not taxes older Australians. So, 
her. And I'm not going to stand in here Order. and be insulted and lectured by the Leader of the Opposition just because I happen to be telling this chamber the truth about what this government does for older Australians. We back them. And if coming in here and suggesting that the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who has been on the record time and time and time again since he's been the Prime Minister, when he was the Treasurer, when he was the Minister for Social Services, saying that he believes that older Australians are an absolute priority of this government. You have a look at the funding that's been putting into aged, into aged care, the support that he does through the Minister for Aged Care. This, this government is a government that backs older Australians, and it doesn't matter how much you yell, how much you scream, how much you insult me uh, through you, Mr. Mr. President. The Leader Order. of the Opposition insults me. The fact Time is, for the we answer back has older expired. Australians. I, I, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of a parliamentary delegation from Samoa, led by the Deputy Speaker of Samoa, the Honourable uh, Nafotoya Keti. On behalf of all the senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate today. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Could the Minister advise the Senate what the government's response has been to the recent attacks on the oil facilities in Saudi Arabia? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Fawcett uh, for his question. Uh, as uh, most Australians will be aware, a deliberate attack was made against civilian oil production infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. The deliberate targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure is against international humanitarian law and against the law of armed conflict. Uh, the Australian government uh, calls on all parties to cease targeting civilian property, including ports, airports, civilian shipping and other non-military locations. We condemn the deliberate target targeting of civilian assets and commercial infrastructure. Mr President, we are still, of course, assessing information and working with our international partners and our posts uh, overseas to fully understand the extent of the damage that has been caused by the attacks on oil infrastructure in Saudi Arabia, including the implications for Australia, for regional security and for global trade. Further analyses of the attacks are being done by e experts, and Australia will make our own assessments, taking into account uh, all the information available as it comes to us. We are, Mr. President, uh, deeply concerned by this deliberate attack, which is clearly designed to destabilise the global economy to affect people's livelihoods. We will continue to work with our allies and partners to ensure regional and global stability in every way that we can. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Could the minister advise the Senate uh, what the implications of this attack are for global fuel supplies? Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. As I said um, in my previous uh, response, uh, the government is, of course, working with our international partners to fully understand the extent of the attacks and the damage caused uh, in relation to the oil infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I do note, however, as the Minister for Energy has uh, said today, there is no immediate threat to Australia's fuel supplies. The International Energy Agency has advised that global markets are well supplied with ample commercial stocks, and uh, it is monitoring the situation as uh, we would expect, Mr. President. Australia is ready to work with the International Energy Agency and its member countries as the situation becomes clearer and uh, as those damage assessments that I have referred to are made. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Could the minister update the Senate on whether the government has any updated or advised advice for Australians planning to travel to Saudi Arabia or the Middle East more broadly? Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. It's a very important question from uh, Senator Fawcett. This government places the safety of Australians and their interests uh, at home and overseas as its highest priority. Uh, aside from safety against terrorism, against cyber attack, against foreign interference and other threats, the government is determined to provide travelling Australians with up-to-date advice on safety and security through my department's Smart Traveller website. I do urge all Australians, Mr President, and dual nationals travelling overseas to monitor the Smart Traveller website, to check for updates regularly even after their journey has begun, and to heed the advice for all countries they are travelling to or travelling through. 
The travel advice level for Saudi Arabia and other nations in the Middle East is at the second highest level. Reconsider your need to travel. There are parts of Saudi Arabia and other nations in the Middle East that are at the highest level of warning. Do not travel. Uh, in some countries, there is risk that Australians and Australian dual nationals could be caught up in attacks made against airports and other civilian infrastructure Order. or other Senator terrorist Payne. attacks. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. The government recently promised pensioners a boost of eight, up to $800. How many pensioner couples out of Australia's 2.5 million pensioners will actually get anything like $800? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. And I thank um, Senator Brown for her question in relation to deeming rates, which the government was pleased um, to make an announcement uh, in July, 14 of July, about reducing deeming rates so that they brought them more in line with the kind of returns that retirees, um, self-funded and partially uh, partial pensioners were receiving on uh, the suite of investments of financial assets that they had uh, available to them. Um, as I said at the time at the announcement that the range um, would range from people uh, up to $1,053 for couples and uh, $804 for singles each year, and that would be the amount that somebody who was on the maximum amount that they would be de uh, of deeming before they were no longer eligible uh, for the aged pension. So um, a number, uh, and so right the way through the whole spectrum, from you know getting just one dollar right the way through for singles 104 and couples 1,053, there were um, a, nearly a million Australians who benefited by the reduction in the deeming rates. Uh, that reduction actually has, is about to take effect now and is backdated to the 1st of July. So um, our pensioners who are affected by deeming will actually feel the benefit of that order. when they get there. Senator Brown, on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr President. A point of order on relevance. The que my question was very clear, and I appreciate the information that the minister has um, put, uh, told the Senate, but the question is, how many out of Australia's 2.5 million pensioners will actually get anything like $800? Um, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question. The minister is talking directly about the subject matter of the question. Um, directly about the subject matter of the question. I can't instruct her how to answer it, um, but I believe she's being directly relevant. Um, and there was in the minister's answer only shortly before your point of order an observation about um, numbers of people, but I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. I believe the minister in this case is being directly relevant. Senator Wong, on the point of order. On, on the point of order, Mr President, um, uh, whilst that is the case, you can remind the minister of the question in appropriate circumstances, and I note that you have done so previously. Um, I, the, Senator Brown has reminded the minister of the nature of her question. Um, and I, uh, and, but in this case, I believe the minister is being directly relevant. Um, I've given the senator an opportunity to restate the question. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, of the, the over two and a half million Australians who are pensioners, about 900,000 uh, of that 2.5 plus uh, million pensioners will actually be impacted on deeming at, within the spectrum of, uh, of the rates that I've said. What I would also say for those opposite uh, as, as, uh, as an explanation about how deeming rates actually work, um, they actually work at a point in time. Um, people's financial assets often will change from time to time. So um, from any time, one fortnight to the next fortnight, there could be a different number of people who would be impacted to the maximum amount or a different amount. So there is no one particular answer that you're able to give. But what I will say, Senator, is that there is a spectrum from $1 to $804 Order, and people Senator will Rustin. fall within Senator that. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Um, th thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm of the 2.5 million pensioner couples, less than 1 per cent will receive $800? How can the minister expect any pensioner to trust this government? Senator Rustin. Yeah. Well, um, look, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Well, I can assure you that the pensions of Australia obviously did trust this government because they voted us back in. Um, what they did was they had a look at what we were offering pensioners 
what our policies were in regards to older Australians, and they made a decision that they wanted us Order. to look after their interests for the next three years. And we're delighted to be able to do that because we believe our older Australians deserve the kind of support that the Morrison government is prepared to give them. We did not go to the election with a suite of measures, a suite of taxation measures that included taxing them taxing their retirement savings. What we went to the election with was a suite of measures that said to older Australians that Order. we would look after them. Now, I would just like to draw the attention to those opposite that if they don't understand the difference between up to and actually stating a number, then obviously they don't read my press releases very clearly. At no Order, time Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr President. Despite the minister Despite the minister's office telling media that no such data existed, documents released under FOI have revealed that less than 1 per cent of pensioner couples will receive the full $800. Why did the minister's office mis mislead the media? What was the government so ashamed of that the minister's office was trying to hide the facts? Senator Rustin. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Brown, for your follow-up question. Um, at no time was the information that you're referring to um, had ever been provided to my office. Subsequent to an request from the media, we sought from the department to collate the information to which you are referring. That information was collated and subsequently provided to the journalist that asked for it. So um, I don't think there's anything to see here, apart from a group of older Australians who chose to vote in this government to look after their interests. Now, if you'd like me to talk about deeming rates, I can talk for hours about deeming rates because I understand clearly that the 900,000 Australians that are benefiting from the reduction in the deeming rate uh, that will actually benefit in the forthcoming week, not only because their deeming rate will reduce uh, the amount uh, that they are deemed to have earned in this particular period, but because they'll also get three months of uh, the reduced deeming rate uh, as a back payment in their next payment. So for the Order, Senator Rustin, time for the answer has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks Order. very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority just downgraded the outlook of the future of the Great Barrier Reef from poor to very poor saying that the biggest threat to the reef is climate change, followed by water quality. This downgrade comes right as the World Heritage Committee is reconsidering whether to list the reef as World Heritage in danger, after 50 per cent of the coral cover of the reef died since 2016. As well as its intrinsic value, 64,000 people rely on the reef to remain healthy for their livelihood. When will this government do what independent scientists, tourism operators, its own agencies and even other nations like Samoa, from whom we have a delegation today, are calling for and adopt a climate policy that will save what's left of the reef. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. You, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as, uh, I believe I might have said in response to a similar question uh, yesterday, uh, the government is committed to effective action uh, on climate change. Indeed, we are on track to meet and exceed our emissions reduction targets uh, signed on to in Kyoto, and we have a plan to meet uh, our emissions reduction target to 2030 agreed to in Paris. Furthermore, the Morrison government is making an unprecedented investment uh, in the Great Barrier Reef with more than $1.2 billion committed. And in fact, the Labor Party and the Greens at various times Order. conspire to criticise us uh, for the level of investment that we were making into the future uh, health of the, of the uh, Great Barrier Reef. Uh, this is a government which is absolutely committed uh, to the Great Barrier Reef, its future health, and of course, we very much understand the importance of the Great Barrier Reef as uh, one of our uh, fa amazing world uh, class uh, tourism assets. Of course, we understand this, which is why we are making that significant uh, investment. And I mean, all we're getting from the Labor Party and the Greens this uh, noise we are getting on with it senator order senator waters a supplementary question thanks president <clears throat> excuse me the australian government is reported to have lobbied for the world heritage committee to not consider climate change when deciding whether sites including the great barrier reef should be listed as world heritage in danger the Prime Minister is also reportedly skipping the International Climate Summit next week and instead meeting with a large donor in Washington. When is this government going to stop its war on climate science, and would you care more about the reef if it donated to you? Senator Cormann, I, 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 I encourage senators to be very careful about imputations 
directed at individual senators. Now we have that I, the words I heard then could be interpreted as an imputation upon an individual senator, which we apply much more strictly, as I reminded the Senate yesterday. So I do ask senators to keep that in mind. I would not like to get into an extensive debate about that. Senator Cormann. No, I completely reject the premise of uh, the question. I refer Senator Waters uh, to uh, my answer to her previous question. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. After years of climate science denial and saying that the real threat to the reef was water quality and not climate, two of your backbenchers are now proposing an inquiry about whether water quality really is a threat to the reef. What do you say to former chief scientist and now head of your reef expert panel, Professor Ian Chubb, who has said that the reef science is robust? peer-reviewed and of the highest quality, and who has compared the campaign against reef science with strategies employed by big tobacco. <coughs> Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, uh, I thank Senator Waters for asking a question about an outstanding motion on the notice paper uh, by Senators Macdonald and Senator uh, McGrath. Uh, of course, uh, you know, on our side, we are absolutely committed uh, to the health of the Great Barrier Reef, and we understand that farmers across Queensland, in particular farmers in North Queensland, deeply care about the health of the Great Barrier Reef, and we believe it's very important uh, for there to be sensible coexistence between economic activity and environmental protection. And I congratulate Senators Macdonald and Senators McGrath for taking this initiative. And if the Greens actually cared about practical environmental protection, you would support that initiative. You would get right behind it because it's a great opportunity to do even better uh, in uh, protecting our Great Barrier Reef into the future. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the leader of the government representing the Treasurer. Is it not the case that Australian Organic Infant Milk Formula, or IMF producer Bellamy's Australia, has been waiting on the Chinese government approvals to sell its product in Chinese retail stores for more than 20 months? Is it not the case that the Chinese government announced in June new rules to further tighten the sale of, of overseas IMF while encouraging Chinese companies to buy out foreign IMF producers? Is it not the case that the Chinese government's strategic regulatory delays has severely impacted Australia's IMF producers, including Bell Bellamy's, putting downward, significant downward pressure on their share prices? Yep. Is it not the case that the, that the Chinese uh, company Menu Dairy Company Limited, uh, the company now seeking to acquire Bellamy's, is partly owned and closely linked to China's state-owned uh, Kofco Group? Will the Foreign Investment Review Board and the Treasurer investigate the role of the Chinese government in manipulating uh, market access to support Order. Chinese Senator company Patrick, buyouts? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, the first point I would make uh, in relation to the broader issue is the government is aware of the announcement by Bellamy's to the uh, ISX. Uh, the government does not comment on matters that are before the Foreign Investment Review Board. But let me just make the general point that foreign investment is a key driver of Australia's economic growth. It creates skilled jobs and improves access to overseas markets and enhances productivity in Australia, which benefits Australian businesses and Australian consumers. Without foreign investment, produc production, employment and income would all be lower. Would all be lower. The government recognises community concerns about foreign ownership and certain Australian assets of certain Australian assets, which is why the Foreign Investment Review Framework allows the government to consider these concerns when assessing Australia's national interests while ensuring Australia remains an attractive place to invest. Uh, where the government finds that a proposal order. is contrary— Senator Cormann. Senator Patrick, on a point of order. My, my question goes to the point of market manipulation by the Chinese government to uh, suppress Senator the Patrick. share price. That was the last part of a very long question that contained a lot of information, and the minister is entitled to answer part of the question. He is being directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe I can assist the senator by describing the role of the Foreign Investment Review Board. Firstly, the board's functions are advisory only. They are responsible for making decisions. Responsibility for making decisions on policy and proposals rests with the treasurer. The role of the board, including through its secretariat, is to examine proposed investments uh, in Australia that are subject to the policy, the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act, and supporting legislation to make recommendations to the treasurer, advise the treasurer on the operation of the policy and the act, foster an awareness and understanding both in Australia and abroad of the policy and the act, provide guidance to foreign persons and their representatives or agents on the policy and the act, and monitor and ensure compliance with the policy and the act, and provide advice to the treasurer on the policy and relate 
while it matters. Now, where the government finds that the proposal is contrary to the national interest, it will not receive approval. Significant reforms, of course, to the foreign investment uh, framework came into effect on 1 December 2015, which improved the monitoring of foreign investment and which means that we're now better able to measure the benefits of foreign investment for all Australians. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. Will the Australian government, through ASIC or FIRB, uh, investigate the allegation that the Chinese government has manipulated the Australian stock market in respect of this takeover? Senator Cormann. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Now, uh, Senator uh, Rex Patrick uh, mentions ASIC. ASIC is an independent, non-statutory agency. It is not up to the government to determine uh, which uh, areas or which action ASIC uh, may or may not take. I mean, in the end, ASIC has got responsibilities that are well understood and well known and that consistent under the Corporations Act. They've got responsibilities. Uh, in relation to uh, market integrity and related matters, and, but it's entirely a matter for ASIC as an independent statutory agency uh, to make these sorts of judgments based on the facts. Uh, that is not a matter for political uh, decision making, and I don't think that businesses around Australia ever would want this to be uh, subject to political decision making. Now, in relation to uh, the Foreign Investment Review Board, I think I've answered that in my previous uh, answer. Senator Patrick. Final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Is it not the case that Chinese Mingyu uh, Dairy is actually incorporated in the notorious tax haven of the Cayman Islands? Will the FIRB and Treasurer investigate Chinese Mingyu uh, Dairy Corporation's structure and obvious international tax minimisation strategies in determining whether the acquisition of Bellamy's is in our national interest? How can the Ch this Chinese takeover of the successful Australian export business be uh, in Australia's national interest? Senator Cormann. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the government uh, will ensure that any foreign investment proposal in relation to any asset that falls under the foreign investment review framework is assessed uh, consistent with our laws to ensure it is not contrary to our national interest. We will not have that consideration uh, play out in public. We will, make that con we will have that consideration uh, appropriately, professionally, in private. And when a decision has been made, uh, the government will explain the decision has been made and the reasons why. Senator Polly. Is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. I refer to the government's own home care package waitlist. Can the minister confirm that there are more than 129,000 older Australians waiting for their approved package, an increase of around 21,000 older Australians since August 2018? The Minister for Aged Care, Senior, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank um, Senator Polly for the question. Uh, can I say I confirm that the figures that Senator Polly has just quoted are actually not correct? In wrong. In her. Uh, correct. In Did you say incorrect? Order. Uh, in, in, fact, um, in fact, Mr. President, I can confirm that as at uh, the uh, 30th of June this year, as at the 30th of June this year, there are over 125,000 home care packages in the market. As at the as at the 30th of June, there are over 125,000 aged care packages in the market, and and Mr. Order, which is an increase, Mr. President, of 25% over the last 12 months, a significant a significant improvement, 25% increase in the number of aged care packages in the market. Senator, over the last 12 months. Senator Watt on a point of order. Mr President, yet again we have ministers refusing to answer the direct the questions they are asked the relevance. On relevance. Are you ruling that a minister, as long as they talk about a word that's in a question, that's relevant? Every time we ask well, a question, I, I, we don't get an yeah, answer well, to the I, question. I, uh, Senator Watt, I'd appreciate a point of order being raised without a reflection upon me in, before well, I even have a chance to It's again rule. and again and again. Oh, is it? Yes. I, um, I actually think no one has challenged the rulings I've offered so far, and I, if you're challenging a ruling I offered earlier today, then I'm happy to review the Hansard if you'd like me to come back to you. On this point of order, you're making a point of order on direct relevance. I am. You've reminded oh, sir, Senator Wong on the point of order. On on the point of order. On the point of order, uh, uh, we do assert 
uh, that the minister is not being directly relevant. The question is very clearly about those directly relevant. He is not being directly relevant. We asked about the number of people waiting for an approved package. And I believe uh, what I would submit to you, Mr. President, is consistent with past rulings around what direct relevance um, it means. It is not directly relevant to simply pick up a word "package" and talk about something entirely different. My observations, then, Senator Wong, were upon a reflection upon me being made in a point of order taken before I'd had an opportunity to rule on previous rulings. Now, if I could rule on this point of order, in, on this occasion, I happen to agree. Under the previous standing orders, where the word relevance was interpreted more liberally, this would have, talking about the topic more generally, in my view, was the precedent and considered appropriate by the Senate. The insertion of the word directly narrowed the scope of what an answer is. So in this case, I remind the minister of the question because talking about a broad policy area, in my view, is not directly relevant. That said, I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question. So I remind the minister of the question, and I would ask that when points of order have been taken, I be given an opportunity to rule before reflections are made on the rulings. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and the opposition might not like the news uh, that we are providing to the Australian people a 25 per cent increase in the number of home care packages available. Senator Polly, on a point of order. Mr. President. Point of order. Um, I'm going to take Senator Polly's point of order, Senator Colbeck, and if you want to contribute to that or take up uh, uh, that, I will, t I will hear from you then. Senator Polly. Point of order, Mr. President, it's on relevance. You've just ruled on the previous point of order, and the minister has not heeded to your direction to him. On the point of order, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, the first thing I said when I started answering this question was that the numbers that Senator Polly quoted in her question were incorrect. I then proceeded to talk about the number of packages that had come into the market in the last 12 months. I was being directly relevant, in my view, to, to the question. Uh, oh, can, can I hear from Senator Colbeck and I'll come to you, Senator Wong? So, so I'm cognisant of your ruling previously, but I'm just making the point that the first thing that I said was that the quote, numbers quoted by Senator Polly were, were incorrect. And I have still 43 well, answers, seconds to answer my question. Senator Wong, did you wish to address the point of order before I rule? Senator Wong. Uh, I think he walked away from it, but I was pointing out that he was reflecting on your ruling, Mr. President. Um, I, I, don't consider, I don't consider a respectful disagreement with my ruling to be a negative reflection. I'm more than robust enough to be able to handle that. On the point of order, though, um, the issue of direct relevance narrowed the scope of what is appropriate in an answer. I have ruled previously that all aspects of an answer, Senator Wong, if I could rule, please, all aspects of an answer must be directly relevant to the question. One cannot simply be directly relevant in part of an answer and then add extraneous material. That is my interpretation of what the standing orders require. So, Senator Colbeck, I will ask you to turn to the question um, with respect to being directly relevant to the question asked, which was, if I recall correctly, and I'll look for confirmation with respect to waiting lists. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and again, as I said, I know the Labor Party don't like hearing good news about the number of aged care, uh, health, home care packages that have come into have come into the market in the last 12 months, and it's a, a significant achievement of this government by improving the Senator numbers. Senator Wong, on a point of, of order. Senator Colbeck. Please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Direct relevance. He is directly flouting your ruling. It's a very dangerous thing to do to your own president. Senator can the minister please answer the question, which is how many can he confirm the number of Australians who are waiting for aged care packages? I think older Australians would like to know. On the point of order. Se order. Could we maintain the dignity of the chamber, Senator. Point of, point of order. Senator Macdonald used to tell me to sit down and shut up, but you know that's this not is a new point from of you. order. That, it's not a point of order, Senator Wong. Senator Senator Bernardi on the point of order or on another the, point on of order. On the point of order, Mr. Mr. President, this is becoming a farce. It's a broadcast day, and people are just making points of order to get on TV. I made. <laughs> Well, at least in that sense, Senator Bernardi, you had more wit than average has been than on average has been shown so far today. Um, 
To be directly relevant to the question, Senator Colbeck, you've had three quarters of the time to answer. Um, I don't believe it is being directly relevant for the full period of two minutes to only talk about um, the issue of what the government has done uh, in this regard. I think the question was quite specific in its nature, and in that sense, I am requiring, I'm asking that you turn to the question, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. And the number of new home care packages in the market is directly relevant to the question because it goes to the waiting list. Because Order. it goes to the waiting Order. list. Senator, I'm going to take Senator Cormann and then I'll take Senator Polly. Order. I'll take Senator Cormann on the point of order. Uh, we've had this habit in recent weeks where uh, Labor frontbenchers don't even let a minister finish a sentence before jumping to their feet seeking, it, seeking to make a point of order. I think, I think they should at least let Senator Colbeck finish a sentence. Senator Wong. On the point of order, the minister has a, had a minute 45. Your president has repeatedly and courteously drawn him to the question. Sorry, I haven't, I haven't got my glasses on. I might be wrong. <laughs> A president elected by, uh, who's nominated by the government, he has repeatedly and courteously drawn the minister to the question, and he is flagrantly ignoring your ruling. And I think everyone watching can see what is occurring. It is somewhat odd to be sitting here and be spoken of in the third person as if one isn't present. I, I will grant that. Um, it's a first for me, um, Senator Colbeck. It is appropriate for order, Senator Watt. It is appropriate, in my view, and, and being directly relevant, for a minister to provide information that is in the policy area. However, um, on a number of occasions I've asked you to come to the specific nature of the question, which was actually about waiting lists, my notes reflect, and after three quarters of the period have elapsed, I think it is appropriate for me to call your attention to the specific nature of the question. Um, that said, I would, he hadn't finished the sentence he'd commenced before a point of order was raised. Senator Colbeck. Uh, no, actually, Mr. President, I am trying to say that the 25,000 extra places have contributed to a 7 per cent decrease in the number of people on the waiting list over the last 12 months, according to the latest figures. Now, order. I need list. Order. I, not go, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question, and it is not appropriate for points of order to seek direction from the chair to instruct a minister as to how to answer a question or the content of an answer. And I am going to start cracking down on those because today has been somewhat ridiculous. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. No, Senator just say so. Mr. Our President, I ask the minister again, and I'm referring to the government's own home care package waitlist. Can the minister confirm that more than 129,000 older Australians are waiting for their approved package, an increase of around 21,000 since August 2018? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as I have said, just said, in the last three months there has been a 7 per cent decrease in the number of people waiting for availability of home care package. A 7 per cent, 7 per cent, a 7 per cent decrease Order in the number of people waiting for a home care package. Directly Order. Please resume your seat, Senator Colbeck. On my left, Numerous points of order were raised asking the minister to be directly relevant. The minister is indeed being directly relevant, but half the Senate won't be able to hear him. So I do ask that the constant interjections cease so that we may hear the senator's response. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. There has been a 7 per cent decrease in the home care waiting list in the last three months, directly relevant to the additional 25,000 packages that 25,000 packages that the government has put into the market in the last 12 months, and so the total waiting list now sits at 119,000. So, as I said at the outset, the number that Senator Polly is talking about is not correct. Senator did, Polly, if you'd listen. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Mr. Order. President. Mr. President, Order. can Senator the minister Polly. confirm that more than 75,000 older Australians 
aren't receiving any home care package at all. And during the last financial year, 16,000 older Australians died while they were waiting for their home care package, for which they had already been approved. Does the minister agree that this is totally unacceptable? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it is true that there are people still waiting for the home care, their home care package. Order. Uh, there are, the people are waiting for the home care package at the assessed level. However, Mr. President, 97 per cent of senior Australians waiting for a home care package are receiving some level of care through either a package at the lower Order. level or a Order. Senator Order. Colbeck, on it. The point of order is with respect to. I'm going to ask senators to draw the point of order at the commencement of the, when they write, stand on their feet. Senator Polly. Relevance, Mr. President. I ask whether the minister can confirm that 75,000 older Australians aren't receiving. Senator Polly. No, no, Senator Polly. I'm going to start cracking down on simple restatements of questions that are not appropriate as points of order. The minister was being directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as, as, as I said, Mr. President, 97 uh, per cent of people waiting for a home care package have received an offer of some form of care while they're waiting for the package at the appropriate level that they've been offered, Mr. President. So, uh, Mr. President, and, and it is a priority, Mr. And, which is why we've put 25,000 new home care packages into the market in the last 12 months, which has actually reduced the waiting list. And Mr. President, the number of home care packages in the market now compares to 60,000 when Labor was last in Senator government, Colbert. and it's gone to 125,000. Senator Bragg. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My Order. question is to the. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please advise the Senate how a strong budget is helping to deliver stability and certainty for job seekers through a number of initiatives aimed at removing barriers to employment? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator Bragg for his question and his uh, ongoing interest in assisting Australians being able to get it back into the workforce. We know that uh, there are many different barriers that Australians face when it comes to getting a job, but one of the most prevalent of those barriers is drug addiction. And that is why the Morrison government is seeking to pass legislation so that we can trial uh, with 5,000 new uh, recipients of New Start and Youth Allowance um, to demonstrate we absolutely have a commitment to breaking down the barriers that people find when it comes to getting a job. With over one third of the Commonwealth budget being spent in social services and, uh, and welfare, we believe that we have an absolute obligation. It is absolutely incumbent on us as a government to make sure that our social safety nets are totally targeted, sustainable and efficient. Uh, and people using their income support for drugs are actually disrespecting their fellow Australians. Because we know uh, that the taxpayers don't have a problem with supporting people in their times of need. We don't have a problem, they don't have a problem uh, with helping out other fellow Australians. But we need to make sure that our welfare system is not just fair to the people who receive it, but also fair to the people who pay for it. And as I said, the taxpayer has every right to expect that the money that they make available to our taxpayer-funded welfare system is being used to assist people in their time of need on things like food, shelter, accommodation uh, and going about their everyday lives. It is not about funding drug addiction. It is not about uh, to providing assistance to them so that they can, uh, can, uh, can take drugs. What it is about is making sure that we are putting them on a trajectory to enable them so that they can get on with their lives free of drugs because, as they spoke, without drug uh, addiction uh, resolution, Order. Senator they won't be able to get Senator a job. Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on the prevalence of the issue of drug use, which imposes barriers to employment? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and one of the things that I think that we do need to be very clear about is that illicit drug use is a barrier to employment. It's a very significant barrier to employment. And it's a barrier to employment, not just being able to get a job, but also to be able to retain a job. 
And anybody who believes otherwise you should take a very clear reality check on what the implication uh, of drugs on a person is and their ability to participate in society. Evidence from the 2016 National Drug Strategy Household Survey undertaken by the AHW shows that when somebody is unemployed, they are more than three times more likely to actually use methamphetamine, more commonly uh, known as ICE, than somebody who is employed. Um, they are one and a half times more likely to actually use cannabis than somebody who is employed. And further evidence uh, released show, uh, by the, recently um, by the Monash University shows that Newstart recipients are also Order. four times Senator more likely Rustin. to use drugs. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate on comparable practices in the business community? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Bragg. Um, look, drug testing is an absolutely common and consistent feature in Australian businesses um, all around this country. Um, if you have an issue with drug abuse, it impacts on your ability to function at work and it impedes your ability uh, to take up a job. Um, and it will prevent you from being able to take a, jo uh, a job that actually requires drug testing. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Australian companies currently require drug testing and alcohol testing of their employees, um, most particularly because of the safety in the work environment. Obviously, you can't use machinery, you can't drive a vehicle. I mean, you know, companies like Linfos, uh, Lin, Lin Fox and Qantas. Uh, constantly require their employees to undertake uh, drug testing. Um, many Commonwealth agencies also require drug testing, and at the risk of channelling somebody that I don't particularly want to channel, even the CFMMEU requires. Um, you know, it called actually in 2015 for a blanket drug and alcohol test for work sites right the way across Victoria. This Order. is commonplace. Senator Rustin. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. The government is keen to introduce a trial for drug testing 5,000 New START recipients. As part of this initiative, your government has announced $10 million in additional funding for drug and alcohol rehabilitation and support services to go along with that trial. What is that money earmarked to go towards specifically, and over how long will it be spent? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Lambie, um, for your ongoing interest uh, in this particular area. Um, as part of the drug uh, trial program, $10 million treatment fund will be set aside to sit alongside the two-year trial program. Uh, the, the, tri the, the treatment fund is divided into three separate areas, uh, the first um, which is allocated against um, specific case management services so that we can uh, apply these services to individuals who test the second time positive in their drug test so that we can wrap uh, around them in an identified and, and um, an individually specific way so that we can actually deal with their specific uh, issues. The second component of is actually um, being able to boost drug treatment capacity uh, in the area. So we will be working within the three trial sites uh, in Mandurah, uh, in Logan and uh, in uh, Canterbury-Bankstown to make sure that the service providers within that particular region um, have the, uh, the capacity to boost up their capacity to meet any increase in demand that may be generated by these particular trials. Obviously, as a government, we would be delighted if we didn't see any increase in the number of people who were going to be requiring treatment in those areas. But we are absolutely prepared uh, and have put the money aside to make sure that we are prepared um, should we see the increase in, uh, in the number of people presenting for support. And we've also got an additional amount of money um, so that we can actually support those individuals once they are in the, uh, undertaking the treatment as part of the trial, because we believe uh, that this is a journey. It is a journey that will be different for each and every person on this trial. Um, hopefully we will be able to intervene early enough with some of them that we will be able to get them back out of their treatment and into, uh, into a job-ready state, um, state very quickly, but others we recognise are going to take longer and will require additional resources. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. It's been reported that trial participants who test positive for drugs would be able to access up to $65,000 in rehabilitation services in Canterbury, Logan and Mandurah. Is that amount consistent with what the government believes is necessary and appropriate to support a new start recipient of drugs and into work? Senator Rustin. 
Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Lambie. Um, the number that, that you are quoting um, is, is not a cap, and it is not a set amount. What we've said is that we believe that we need to set aside um, for the 5,000 people that we will be testing uh, the amount of people that we um, we believe possibly will go through both of their tests and come out positive that will re require our additional help. We've set aside $10 million. Now, if we don't need to use all that $10 million, we will be absolutely delighted. But equally, we need to make sure that there are adequate resources on an individual case-by-case -case basis to be able to sort people. There will be some that will not require very much at all. We hope there will be some that will be immediately deterred from even having the drugs so that they, are, they don't pos test positive in the first place. But if they do and they end up testing positive for the second time, we want to make sure there are adequate resources. So the $65,000 figure that was put out into the marketplace um, was just an extrapolation on the number of people that possibly could test positive and the amount of money Order. that's been made Senator available. Rustin. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. So, if you're going to spend $65,000 per positive drug test, on my figures, you'd be spending around $1.6 billion a year on rehab if this was rolled out nationally. So, whether you're prepared to spend it or you're already fudging it, what on earth do we get out of a trial that isn't true to how this would operate nationally? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Lambie. Obviously, because it is a trial, we are seeking to build up and, and develop a body of evidence so we can understand the magnitude of the problem, but also to understand where people may well sit within uh, the spectrum of the seriousness of their, their drug addiction or their substance abuse problem. Um, we understand that the cost to society of people who have long-term drug addiction is very, very significant, um, and the $65,000 uh, amount that you refer to, as I mentioned in my previous answer, is, as I said, it's not a cap. It's not an amount that we're applying per person. It is just an extrapolated number that came from the $10 million and the number of estimated people that may will test positive twice during this particular trial. But what we would say is the cost to society of people who are on drugs, the cost to themselves, their families and their communities is immense. And we believe that by getting people off drugs, deterring them in the first place for even going, uh, trying drugs, is one of the most important things that the government can do for all Australians. Order. Senator Ruskin. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When asked yesterday why the Prime Minister is allowing the member for Chisholm to dodge accountability order. to the Parliament, the Minister said the statement— Order, order. Sorry. I, I couldn't hear the question and call me um, predictive, but I might predict a point of order may come up subsequently. Um, can I ask Senator Kitching to restart it? Because I could not hear the start of the question. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When asked yesterday why the Prime Minister is allowing the member for Chisholm to dodge accountability to the Parliament, the Minister said the statement, and I quote, was tabled in the Parliament. It has got the force of being tabled in the Parliament in her name. But the very same day the Speaker of the House ruled that, and I quote, if a member is tabling a statement that's made outside the House, that really is just a record of a statement. Who is right, this Minister or the Speaker? Why is the Prime Minister assisting the member for Chisholm to dodge parliamentary accountability? Can I, can I, before I call Senator Cormann, the term used there was specific about a member of another place and actually used the words dodge accountability. I'm going to reflect on precedent, but I think that dance is particularly close to 1933, which is an imputation of improper motive and all personal reflections on members of another place. I said yesterday, and I made it clear again earlier today, that reflections upon groups of people, reflections upon actions, are very different to reflections upon persons and specific persons in another place. So I will take that hand away and consult with the clerks about precedent, but I urge senators to be very, very careful about imputations and reflections specifically about individuals as opposed to actions or groups of individuals. Senator Wong, on the point of on uh, what I just on, said. On the point of order, we, we accept that um, we, we understand that your indication that you are taking this matter away to consider it. Uh, and uh, I also uh, reflect. Um, or respect your ruling from yesterday and I think the day before in relation to you know, 
plurals versus individuals, you know, co co collective insults as opposed to individual. I, I would make the point here for your consideration when you're co subsequently considering the hand side, Mr. President. Uh, the point, there is a point about accountability to the parliament the opposition is seeking to press. If, it, if the, and we all know that a statement to the parliament is very different to one outside the parliament. That is the point we wish to press. Now, if the problem is the word dodge, we're happy to um, uh, insert the word avoid. Um, and that's what I'll come back with because um, it's, it is actually the terminology that, to me, crosses into potential personal reflection upon an individual member of this parliament, which may be inappropriate. But I'm not ruling the question out of order. I'm asking senators to be very cognizant because I think the point can easily be made without getting into the territory of breaching that standing order. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, firstly, I mean, I reject the premise of the question, and that goes to the point that you've uh, also made on the standing orders, uh, Mr. President. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, the, I don't see any inconsistency between my statement and the statement of the Speaker. Of course, it's a record of statement which was tabled in the Parliament. And I would make just three more points. Uh, firstly, uh, the, uh, Gladys Liu was elected as the member for Chisholm because the majority of uh, Australians in Chisholm uh, voted for her and for the Liberal Party. Number two, uh, the Prime Minister and the government has full confidence uh, in the member for Chisholm. And number three, if the Labor Party has anything other than smear and innuendo, then put it up. Put it up. Uh, otherwise, let's get on to deal actually with matters that are genuinely in the public interest, other than this smear, innuendo and dog whistling. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the Prime Minister allow the member for Chisholm to make a statement to the parliament? Senator Coleman. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the member for Chisholm is an elected member of parliament who fulfils her responsibilities as she sees fit. It's an offensive question. And again, I say it again. I say it again. If the Labor Party has anything other, if the Labor Party has got anything other than grubby smear and innuendo, then put it up. Otherwise, shut up. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. On at least six occasions now, the Prime Minister and Ministers Cormann and Payne have refused to assure the Parliament that Ms. Liu is a fit and proper person to sit in the Australian Parliament. Will the Minister now finally give that assurance? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I completely reject the premise of the question. The only thing the government has refused to do is to play Labor Party word games. I say, I say it again. I say again what I said in response to the, to the primary question. Gladys Lewis, a member for Chisholm, Order. because Senator the majority Wong. of people in the majority Senator of Wong. voters. The reason Senator Gladys Lewis, a member for Chisholm, is because Senator the majority Wong. of people in Chisholm gave Ms. Liu. Their confidence. Their confidence. That is something that seriously upset the Labor Party, which is why they're pursuing this grubby, grubby smear without any evidence of anything whatsoever. We have full confidence in the member for uh, Chisholm. She does an outstanding job. Uh, the member for the uh, people of Chisholm knew why they were supporting her rather than the alternative, because they wanted a continuation Order. of good Liberal national government. Senator Cormann. I, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise today to take note of the answers given by Senators Rustin, Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Keneally, Brown and Polly. Well, this afternoon's question time shows very much that Australians who rely on the government cannot rely on them. We have here in all the answers to this question time, an absolute demonstration of the abject failure of this government to stand up for the needs of pensioners, of people on Newstart and people who re rely on aged care, including home care. The government cannot own up to the fact that it has attacked pensioners in every budget since 2014 all budgets all budgets since 2014 the government's budget has included cuts to the pension we have a prime minister who is determined 
to cut the pension and to increase the pension age, forcing farmers, bricklayers and nurses to work until they are 70. Equally, this government doesn't want to be seen to let the truth stand in the way of a good front page. The gall of promising needy and vulnerable Australians a boost of up to $800 in their pension, putting that on the front page of the paper and then finding, surprise, surprise, the money is not there at all. How many pensioner couples out of Australia's two and a half million pensioners got anything like $800? Well, you had to get called out on that, didn't you, to own up to the fact that actually documents under FOI show that seniors secure just $5 a week on average for singles. The average windfall for aged pensioners with the change of deeming rates is just $249 for singles, a fraction of the $800 that the pensioner bonus heralded across the front pages of Australians, Australia's papers in July. Now, the gall of this kind of false spruiking of the government is pretty incredible, actually. One, because the nature of the front page really didn't make it clear to Australian pensioners that unless they actually had investments, they weren't going to see a cent of that increase in funding, because it is just a change in the deeming rate, let alone the fact that if the government wanted to correct deeming rates so that it could put $800 back in the pockets of Australians uh, who, pensioners who have investments, they could have changed the deeming rate more substantially in order to create a true reflection of an adjustment like that. But no, that is not what you did. You made measly changes to the deeming rates that aren't a true reflection of the kinds of rates of return that pensioners are likely to be receiving currently. If you've got uh, an investment of up to $51,000, then the government's currently deeming that you'll, you will get a return of more than a per cent on that investment, even though many, many, many pensioners will not be seeing returns anything like that let alone investments of over $50,000 getting a return of more than 3 per cent. Now, you knew that all along when you made these uh, announcements. In order to get $800 uh, back, you would have had to make far more substantial changes to the deeming, to the deeming rates. So it is incredibly galling, Madam, Acting, Madam Deputy President, I'm sorry, that this government for all of its rhetoric of standing by Australians who need their support, that all they can do is spew out measly weasel words, to false promises and do nothing but cut in all of their delivery. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note. And I think what is really galling here today, Senator Pratt, through you, Madam Deputy President, is that the Labor Party so quickly has forgotten the decision of the Australian people just a few short weeks ago. And one of the key issues, one of the key issues, Senator Pratt, that uh, addressed the minds of the voters of Australia, particular, particularly the, the older voters of Australia, was who could be trusted who could be trusted between those opposite and those on this side to look after older Australians. And I think that the, uh, I, I think that the, the people in Australia answered pretty decisively on that particular issue. They answered quietly but decisively. Senator McGrath, I will accept that interjection. Order. And, and we on this side will not be lectured by those whose policies sought to take to the Australian people an additional tax burden of $387 billion—$387 
$387 billion, including taxes directly targeting retirees. Uh, this, this was an absolute disgrace. And I will get to I will take that interjection, Senator Pratt, and I will get to pensions. Just hold your horses. I will get to pensions. And pensions order. Pensions. Let's talk about pensions for a little bit. And I'll get to deeming rates as well if I've got time. So pensions. From the 20th of September 2019, pensions have increased by $125 a fortnight for singles, $188 a fortnight for couples since the coalition was elected in 2013. Pensions are indexed twice yearly, something those opposite seem to have forgotten, though it's um, been going on for a little, little while now, and they continue to grow in line with that indexation. But that is not all this government is doing to assist older Australians with the cost of living pressures that we know are very, very real. In fact, $46.8 billion has been provided uh, to financial assistance to older Australians, and this will increase to over $53 billion in, by 2021-22. Uh, what else is this government doing to assist older Australians? $365 million uh, for over two years, from 2018-19 for an energy assistance payment to 5 million income support recipients, uh, $75 for singles, $62 each for eligible members of a couple. Um, and of course there's the deeming rates issue. Um, the minister on the 14th of July announced a reduction in the deeming rates. This reduction ensures that those rates are responsive to changing economic conditions and the current economic environment. A million Australians will benefit from a $600 million boost to pensions. They will receive up to, and I repeat up to, and this was always very clear, $1,053 for couples, $804 for singles each year. Now, up to, two very simple words, but two very simple words that those opposite don't seem to understand. Um, we are about ensuring our welfare system, our support for all Australians in need of assistance, including our pensioners, is sustainable into the future. Social security and welfare are a cost to the taxpayer of $172 billion in the 2018-19 financial year. This is not an amount that can be ignored. It is a very significant part of the budget, a very significant amount of money. And this government takes its responsibilities to all those who receive government assistance, but particularly to pensioners, very, very seriously. We will continue to do the right things by older Australians because this is a government that knows how to manage money and knows how to balance its budgets and knows how to provide the assistance that older Australians need. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Polly. Deputy President, after six long years of a Liberal government, what have we got with the aged care sector? It is broken. Why is the aged care sector broken? It's because the Prime Minister as Treasurer cut, cut, cut to the aged care sector. After three failed ministers, we have seen a Royal Commission being called into the aged care sector. This is a government that had to call a Royal Commission into its own failing. And what did we see on display here in Question Time today? We had the fourth aged care minister fail to even comprehend, let alone answer, the very simple question whether or not there's 129,000 older Australians waiting for their aged care packages. We have also have figures of some 16,000 older Australians have died while they've been waiting for their approved aged care package. This is such an indictment on this government. We have a Prime Minister, after he was elected, was telling the Australian people that aged care was a priority for his government. Well, when are we going to see some action? It is not good enough 
to call a royal commission into the aged care sector and wait to 2020 for their report to start doing something. We've had some 16, 16 reports, I should say, into the aged care sector, and each and every one of those are sitting now on Senator Colbeck's desk gathering dust because they have failed to act. We don't need a Royal Commission to understand what the challenges are in this sector. We all know them. Senator Dunningham is looking at me very blankly when he was on a committee where he heard the evidence. He heard the evidence of the crisis that's facing the aged care sector. We have a workforce shortage. We don't have enough people wanting to work in this sector because they don't pay enough. They are not getting the respect. And what does this government do? Throw their hands in the air and say it's not our problem, it's the sector's problem. Well, it's about time the Liberal government under Mr Morrison started to show some leadership in this sector. Older Australians deserve it. They deserve our respect. Those that work in this sector deserve our respect. These are some of the most vulnerable people in our country. And what has this government done? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Senator Colbeck comes from my home state of Tasmania. We have the oldest rapidly ageing population in the country with some of the worst health conditions. And what do we have demonstrated in this place today in question time? Disinterest. How could he not know how many people are waiting for their home care package? It's, it's just beyond belief that a new minister wouldn't have the brief to understand what the major issues are with his responsibility from his own department. Now, we on this side have had as a priority for more than a dozen years that we needed to work together. We have offered countless times to work with the government because all they've been able to do is produce three failed ministers. They can't even have the Minister for Aged Care and Older Australians in their cabinet. Labor in the last Labor government, we had a cabinet minister with the responsibility. That's how seriously we took this policy area. Older Australians deserve a lot more than a prime minister who tells the Australian people, I'm going to be a prime minister of love. What Australians need is more love. Well, that love should start here with older Australians. Those opposites should be hanging their head in shame because it is clearly not good enough. And not one senator on that side can stand up and defend their record. Three failed ministers, one new minister that comes from Tasmania who should know intimately the issues facing older Tasmanians, fail to answer the simplest of questions. Imagine if we started asking him some difficult questions. <laughs> I mean, believe you me, what we will be doing is I hope I get the opportunity to ask more questions because the Australian people need to know that they have been conned by those people on that side, absolutely conned. Because if the Prime Minister's actions and his new minister goes anywhere to demonstrate the priority that they give to older Australians where they should hang their Thank heads you, in Senator shame. Thank you, Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. It is Senator Polly in the Labor opposition who failed to comprehend. The minister himself answered over 97 per cent of senior Australians waiting for a package at their assessed level have been offered support from the Commonwealth Government. That's not difficult to understand. It's not difficult to Order. understand. 97 per cent. 97 per cent. The list of people waiting has gone down by 7 per cent in just three months. That's a great effort by the minister. Order. What a great effort. Okay, new home care packages have increased from just 60,308 places under Labor in 2012-13. They are now up to 124,000, and by 22-23, they will be up to 157,000, an increase of 161 per cent. And why are we not surprised that Labor can't add up here? Why aren't we? Because they can't. It's very simple. It's very simple. Since the coalition government was elected, 
aged care spending has increased by an average of more than 8 per cent each year. That is, on average, a billion dollars of extra support for older Australians each year since the coalition government has, has been in power. Sorry. Further, our record on home care. Since 2017-18, the government has announced the release of over 40,000 new home care packages across all levels. This year's budget will deliver an extra 10,000 home care packages to be released across all levels at an investment of $282 million, and that is thanks to the strong economic management of the coalition government. This, commi this commitment is part of the government's broader record investment in aged care that will deliver an additional $7 billion in funding over the next five years. years. The release of these packages, in recognition of the increasing demand for home care, uh, will be in line with the available budget. Okay. The government has also announced reductions to the maximum basic daily fee to apply from 1 July 2019. Maximum basic daily fees will reduce by $400 for Level 1, $200 for Level 2 and $100 for Level 3. There has been no change for Level 4. Home care packages are key to supporting senior Australians to remain living in their home, yet they do not replace primary care as part of the broader health system, including services accessed via general practices and hospitals. And can I say the coalition government has increased uh, health funding to the, my home state of Queensland by $1.8 billion over the last five years, an average of 12 per cent. The aged care system has mechanisms to provide support, support to those in urgent need for home care package, ensuring that people with high priority can get access to a home care package or other supports when required. As of, March, as of September this year, based on March data, there were 99,110 people in home care package. This represents an annual increase of 14,000 or about 17 per cent since 31 March 2018. The number of people in a high level, level three and four, home care package at March 19 was around 45,000, which is 22,000, about almost 100 per cent more people than there were in March 17. 116,843 people accessed a home care package in 2017-18 which means approximately 1.3 people accessed each available package. This reflects those entering and exiting care over time. Okay. By 2021-22, over 74,000 high-level home care packages will be available, an increase of 86 per cent on 2017-18 figures. Of the 119,000 people who were waiting for a home care package at their approved level at 30 June 19, 97 per cent have been approved with the opportunity to connect to Commonwealth subsidised aged care support. Okay, Mr President, Labor must be bitten once, bit, once bitten twice shy. They've come into this chamber today pretending to be the friend of senior Australians. They have apparently learnt the very harsh lesson handed to them at the recent unlosable election under the former Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Senator Rennick, and I'm not Mr President. Senator Walsh. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers to questions asked by Senators Keneally, Brown and Polly uh, regarding the government's record on the aged pension and older Australians. Uh, and what a terrible record it is. In answer to the question, since 2014, how many budgets have included cuts to the pension, Minister Rustin said the government has, and I quote, a proud record for older Australians, a proud record, uh, that this government could be trusted to look after older Australians. But in fact, this is a government that has consistently planned to increase the age for receipt of the aged pension to 70 years of age. This is a government that wants older Australians to work till the age of 70 before they can access the aged pension. Uh, and on this question, when asked about this, 
Uh, Minister Rustin said, this is a government, and I quote, that is looking after older Australians. And this is a government that backs older Australians. Well, let's take a look at how this government has backed older Australians, how they've looked after older Australians. Let's look at their proud record for older Australians. Uh, and in answer to Senator Brown's question about how many pensioners will get a boost uh, to pensions of the promised $800 due to deeming rates changes, uh, we got no answer. Uh, and in fact, of the 2.5 million pensioners, less than 1 per cent will get that promised amount, less than 1 per cent. 99 per cent won't get this promised $800. Uh, and Minister Rustin cannot explain how that, how that fact backs older Australians. Uh, and in fact, this government is a government that has tried to cut the pension uh, in every one of its budgets. In every one of its budgets. Uh, and of course, we have a minister uh, who has famously called the pension earlier this year, uh, and I quote, generous. She's called the pension generous for all Australians. Uh, and what about Minister Colbeck's uh, comments uh, on the more than 129,000 older Australians who are waiting for a home care package. Um, these are people who are in desperate and genuine need right now, today. Uh, and the minister had no answer for them whatsoever, no answer for those 129,000 Australians who are in need, desperate need, right now, today. Uh, and they and all Australians deserve answers on these questions. Those Australians deserve answers on all those questions. So let's have a look then at this government's proud record uh, in backing uh, older Australians, because in fact this third term Liberal coalition government has not backed older Australians, it has attacked older Australians. Their record really says it all, because, being, uh, because since being elected in 2013, uh, they have tried to cut pension indexation, forcing pensioners to live on just $80 a week within 10 years if they had been successful. And they did cut $1 billion from pension concessions, concessions that had helped pensioners with the cost of living. Uh, and they did cut the $900 senior supplements card for self-funded retirees. They've tried to cut the pension for those going overseas which would have left 190,000 pensioners worse off—190,000 pensioners worse off. Uh, and they did cut the pension for 370,000 pensioners by changing the assets test—370,000 pensioners. And those pensioners lost up to $12,000 a year. They've also tried to cut the energy supplement for new pensioners, a supplement meant to help older Australians keep themselves warm in winter uh, and cool in summer. And again, this is a government with a proud record. This is a government that backs older Australians. This is a government that older Australians can count on. And on top of all of this, they spent five years trying to increase the pension age to 70. Five years trying to increase the pension age to 70. Uh, so, Madam Deputy President, I think the record is pretty clear. This is a government that does not respect older Australians. Um, on its own record, this is not a government that backs older Australians. This is not a government that has a proud record, as it claimed today, for older Australians. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy President, I rise to, take note of answers. I rise to take note of answers in response to a question asked by Senator Patrick. Of Deputy which minister? Uh, Senator Cormann. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. Foreign investment in Australia is a very sensitive, very thorny, very confronting issue for a lot of Australians, especially in my home state of Tasmania. It's one of the key questions I get asked about when I get around the state. Now, I've always supported foreign investment as long as the laws and the regulations around those foreign investment are robust and they deliver in the national interest. And I think it's incumbent on every senator in here to make sure we do have laws in this country and processes that are robust and have community confidence. The questions asked by Senator Patrick demand 
answers. Now, yesterday I found out that uh, one of the last Tasmanian companies left, uh, Bellamy's Organics, uh, a company listed on the stock market that's been an international success, has a takeover offer under a, from a foreign company, uh, a Chinese company called Mengu. Now, when I found out about this, my first response was one of surprise, because uh, this company, Bellamy's, uh, just over 18 months ago, had had a virtual share price crash when they had found, found out that the Chinese government hadn't granted them certification to sell their high-value milk-based products into China. Now, the share price went from uh, nearly $24 uh, down to $7 or $8. I want to paint a picture for the senators in the chamber here today. I'll let you guys, I'll let you guys draw the dots if you choose to do this. So, if I'm an investor in this, this very promising Tasmanian Australian company, and I see my share price fall and my value of my investment, I may be a re retiree with a superannuation fund, fall by two thirds. Now, the company very patiently over the next 18 months says they're waiting for approval from the Chinese government to sell their products into China. Then you find out that your company, your management of your company, had accepted a takeover offer to sell the shares at half the price you paid for them to, and this is, this is the interesting part, to a Chinese company that has its biggest shareholder in the Chinese government, the same government that won't give them the accreditation and the certification process they need to sell their products. What would you, what would you do and what would you think? Throw into this, throw into this the fact that this Chinese uh, government-owned competitor is their biggest competitor in the market. Your company, Bellamy's, has taken away market share because of what was a very valid scare, the melanin scare in China, where melanin, a poisonous product, was mixed into milk powder. And you find out that your company has been in uh, discussions with its biggest competitor, a Chinese government-owned competitor, for nearly six months. You'd be forgiven for thinking that the share price of your stock had been suppressed by not getting approval to sell into China, and the same company that is buying your company, that's partly owned by the Chinese government, reports today vary from 18 to 28 per cent, have deliberately manipulated the share price of that company, ex exhibited predatory behaviour towards the stock price, and come in and bought your asset at a steal. The question I would like to know from the CEO of Bellamy's is why sell the company now? If you've been waiting patiently to get your accreditation in China, if you've been waiting, why sell the company when the historic share price tells you that you're very likely to have had a significant revaluation of your share price and valuation had you got that accreditation? Was the CEO and was the company not confident that it was ever going to get approved in China. Now, this raises a number of really important questions for our Treasurer to look at. The Foreign Acquisitions and Takeover Act 1975 requires that foreign investment is not contrary to the national interest. Our government's foreign investment policy states that the national interest test recognises the importance of Australia's market-based system, where companies are responsive to shareholders and where investment and sales decisions are driven by market forces. There's a whole range of questions here that need to be asked in the FERB process. I have written to the Treasurer today, and I know other senators in this place, such as Senator Patrick and Senator Lambie, feel very uh, deeply about this issue. I've written to both the Treasurer and to our Foreign Minister and asked some hard questions about what they didn't did know about the certification process and what exactly they will be looking at in terms of the FERB process. This sets a very bad precedent if we let foreign companies do this to Australian Order. businesses. Senator Bush Wilson, time for the debate has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Bush Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.